yes, we want someone to go through a rigorous set of online courses with us, get a credential, go through a boot camp, get a credential, and then we want to create an apprenticeship opportunity and have the person go spend three to six months at the United Nations, yeah. at, uh, you know, perhaps FIFA, mm. at a startup, mm. at, um, at Pfizer, at, uh, at a university, uh, being an apprentice to, 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 to a person who is on the cutting edge. And, and that, in its own right, then becomes a credential to and your pathway to a new opportunity in, in, yes. in, in your vocation. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Very excited to still be at MIT in Cambridge in Massachusetts. We are now gonna be talking about new pathways in education. We have Erdin Beshimov joining us on the show. Hello so much. Pleasure being with you. I'm super excited. And I'm very grateful to Sanjay Sarma for introducing us. That was also an incredible episode at MIT's Open Learning Center. I love this place. You guys are doing incredible work. And for those that don't know Erdine's background, he's the founder and director of MIT Boot Camps, MIT X MicroMasters, co-created MIT's first MOOC on entrepreneurship, and is a lecturer at MIT. He's passionate about building a world where there are no barriers between motivation and opportunity. And you can find Erdine's links below. Let's start things off with our favorite question we love asking. We find ourselves as stewards of Earth. What is your current take on the state of humanity? It's a wonderful question to ask uh, and an important one. I think the current zeitgeist is one of anxiety. Humanity has reached uh, an impasse on, on a number of uh, levels. Uh, we are concerned about the effects of technology on the world. And uh, for, for the last few decades, we've uh, lived with the idea that uh, technology is a friend of humanity. And I think this idea is beginning to show cracks. In fact, serious, serious cracks. And so we as humans are, are anxious. We are anxious because we don't have the answers today. And, and so the, the current zeitgeist is uh, one of anxiety and the current mission is one of finding, finding the answers. Uh, I also think uh, we have um, build, building uh, various forms of um, managing our global society, right? Uh, the, the 20th century was uh, a century of wars but it was also a century of um, building international organizations that can prevent future wars. But now we see the, the departure from that model. We see a uh, breaking apart of vital international organizations. Now, my view of this is our existing structures are, if not collapsing, but weakening, not because, you know, people are bad and uh, they don't want them, but because perhaps they are not answering the present realities, the present challenges. And so I think the challenge is upon us to invent new structures, to, um, to imagine new ways of being. Yeah. That would be my answer. I, w I wonder if every single time period, like 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, that they were constantly thinking, oh, this is such a challenging time to be alive. We have so many problems to tackle, but we do have all the exponential technology happening today, which makes it obviously d different than, than in the past. And I think we can do it, especially with millennials and Gen Z. I have a lot of faith in our ability to do things like tackle these, these challenges. Um, let's do the journey. So from Kyrgyzstan to the University of Bradford in the United Kingdom to Harvard and then to MIT. Teach us about how you even you know, got the, the courage and, the, and to the motivation to leave home and to go pursue uh, your career. Well, uh, I, I appreciate you, you, you asking this and being interested. I think the simple answer is um, one of uh, angels. You know, everybody needs angels. Uh, I was uh, in Kyrgyzstan as, uh, you know, as, 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 a, as a teenager, and uh, my world um, seemed very small. And uh, I think when it, when it feels this way, you want to open up and when you want to expand your world. But how do you do that? It's, um, it's, it, it's, not, it's not so easy. And um, it, it just so happened that uh, in our hometown, there was uh, a, a center um, established by George Soros, the um, well-known uh, financier and uh, philanthropist, and he opened a network of uh, what he called uh, open society centers, where you could go and uh, it uh, offered a library that was free and you can read books in English, you could study English, you could read about universities in, in other countries. And so I would just spend a little bit of time there. 
And then also um, I, um, I began attending a university in, in Kyrgyz Kyrgyzstan called the American University in Kyrgyzstan. Um, I didn't graduate from it. I ended up graduating in, uh, from college in, in the United Kingdom. But uh, that university was started with the idea of bringing liberal arts education to the former Soviet Union. And we had uh, American and European academics going and teaching there. And the, as I reflect on them now, they had this uh, fabulous dedication to teaching. And so they got me inspired. They got me inspired by learning. They got me inspired by, by learning something that uh, young people like me in our country couldn't ordinarily study before, political science and to study the liberal thinkers. That was, that was a novelty. And so I got impassioned by that and uh, won a scholarship to, to Bradford. But again, yeah, to the topic of angels, yes, I did win a scholarship. Did I work very hard? I did. But did I get lucky in some respects? Of course. Of course. Somebody on the other end at Bradford University had to review my scholarship application. And, you know, they had to be having a good day. And they had to say, well, you know, I want to I see something here. I want, you know, I want to trust this person who is behind this, behind this application. And so I think the, the journey is one of uh, working hard and, and taking a chance, but also angels, you know, in everyone's lives are angels. And um, I've had, uh, I've been very lucky with a fair share of uh, mine in my life. And then you're pointing at the really important, um, these, these different stimuli that can be uh, such crucial to altering the trajectory and maximizing the potential of people and like the resource center that was made available to you and then um, all of the, the, the next steps that you took, the doors that you saw and that you seized those opportunities and you kept going. This is a reoccurring theme of the people that we sit down with is, is exactly that. Um, then how about we do this uh, this journey when you get to this M MIT's Sloan School of Management. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so then you're you're figuring out that like open learning is very interesting, and you want to you ended up uh, being the co-founder and director then of of MIT's boot camps, MITx's MicroMasters. This is I mean this is all like this is all really cool stuff, and it's all open, which is so interesting too. Yeah, you know it. Um it, it, it's a journey that's uh, been long in the making. When I, first, when I first came to Cambridge, Massachusetts from Bradford, I actually came to a conference with the idea of perhaps applying here for graduate school. And I, I remember the day that I walked into um, Old Yard in, um, you know, at, at Harvard. Um, I, I remember clear as day, and uh, at, at that time, I, you know, we didn't have uh, cell phones that we could take pictures with, so I, the, the, sort of the, the, the recollection of the moment is, is, is here and here only. Uh, I remember it clear as day, and I remember this um, sense of intellectual vibrancy. Yes. Yeah, you, could, you could feel it. It was an amazing feeling. And I asked myself, how is it that only a few students in the world, those that are here in Cambridge, uh, in, uh, in schools at Harvard and MIT, have the opportunity of access to, to this wonderful stuff? And why don't kids in Kyrgyzstan, my home country, have it too? That was really a question that was on my mind literally the moment I walked in. And so when I later came to school at MIT, I actually started, uh, so to speak, running and gunning. I would have a camera and I would go to different labs and take little interviews. But at the time, there was nowhere to put it. There was no platform where you can, you can achieve uh, visibility with the content you're creating. And so I uh, graduated from MIT. I ended up uh, founding a company that uh, went uh, to, to uh, a venture capital firm. But then suddenly things changed. Um, I call it uh, the uh, second revolution in online education. We saw the emergence of new educational platforms, Udacity, uh, Coursera, then uh, MIT and Harvard joined forces and established edX. And um, I realized that that was a moment. I had to go back to MIT to be a part of this revolution. So I left uh, the venture firm, came to MIT, and uh, began creating online courses because now, now, which is was was different from when I was a student, you know, with my own camera and my friends in different labs here. There was a place to distribute your videos online and reach a lot of people and have impact. Yeah, the, this being able to see that, why is this such a strong nodal cluster of intelligence and creativity and access to the tools that let you build the future and why is it not yet democratized to other places around the world? And then, yeah, actually having the platforms to be able to put the content on to enable people around the world, just the computer and internet connection to be able to pursue that kicked in. And then you're able to really unleash that 
So then, yeah, so then tell us about how you ended up picking up to be able to take all of the content you're learning here at MIT and putting it up to, for distribution. Oh, yeah, my, my thought was uh, relatively straightforward. I asked myself, well, what um, professors did I enjoy during my uh, time as student here? Who did I benefit the most from? And who do I think people around the world would benefit from uh, as well? And uh, the first person was uh, Bill Olet. He was my mentor at MIT. He was the head of our entrepreneurship center. And uh, I just knew that um, he had to be heard by entrepreneurs worldwide. And so I went to him and I said, Bill, can we create a version of your course uh, for entrepreneurs at MIT, for entrepreneurs around the world? That's great. And we did it. The course was called the Entrepreneurship 101, Who is Your Customer? And we wanted to teach um, aspiring uh, entrepreneurs one of the um, most important uh, learning journeys for any entrepreneur, and that is to begin seeing the world through the eyes of the customer. Uh, entrepreneurs are idea-driven people, tend to be. And so it is very easy for them to see the world through, through their own eyes. And, and there is nothing wrong with that. You, you actually want that because you want to have a person with a vision. But that also has the flip side, that the vision can take over the reality. And you have to play with the balance. That was the goal of the course. We, uh, we worked very hard. There were many sleepless nights. But uh, I remember the day we launched the course. And um, in, in, in a DAX, in the course management uh, tool, we had a dashboard that tells you how many students uh, are enrolling. And I was amazed how that um, dashboard ticker kept rolling. And uh, by, uh, by the end of the course, we had more than 60,000 students in, in the, the first, first. Yeah, in, wow. in the first instance. People want to know about entrepreneurship. People want to know about how to start ideas, execute ideas. Yeah, they do. They do. And uh, that's because so I, uh, that's what I realized through that experience. I, I sensed it. I had a hunch that, yes, the, the passion that I have for entrepreneurship is not, is not a unique passion. I think it is something that we, many of us share. And I think if we go back to kind of the, to the more um, established or um, kind of historical roots of human society, we're all entrepreneurs, right? Um, we're all small business owners uh, before the emergence of you know, very complex societies in which yes. we live today. So it, I, I think that's natural. And what I realized in the course that was fundamental to me, I realized that people want to be entrepreneurs not because they want to be rich. That's what I think uh, one would be apt to think by, by following entrepreneurship through the eyes of popular media. Yeah. I don't think that's the answer. I think people want to be entrepreneurs because they want to be independent. It's not wealth, it's independence. It's independence of worldview, it's independence of action. And you know, if it bring, and obviously sometimes that's uh, correlated with um, economic independence. Mm -hmm. But um, economic independence and, and wealth they are correlated, they're not the same. They're not the same. And so as soon as I discovered that, uh, I think uh, my, my professional worldview changed dramatically. Yeah, yeah. I ideas uh, getting executed is a lot for us finding some sort of a of meaning in life as well. We can, that waking up every morning and wanting to build the thing that we came up with and wanting to work on that is something that drives so much meaning. And yeah, it gives us that independence, uh, especially that free thinking, like you're saying, that's so critical. Um, economic freedoms, very critical. Um, yeah, and that, that's crazy. That MOOC that you started on Entrepreneurship Now has hundreds of thousands of people. That's it right. has uh, 65 countries, something no, really uh, All countries in the all, world. All countries in the world. We have, all students, countries. we have students from every country in the world. Okay, it's boot camps that has the, the 65, I think, or something Correct. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, I, okay. I, I'm, I'm very happy to share about that as yes, well. Yes, let's do that. So that's crazy that the entrepreneurship course has been just blowing up like that. I love it. That means there's going to be lots more ideas executed. Yeah, let's hit boot camps. This is interesting. You guys actually just had, um, a, you or you have a couple that are coming up over the summer that's across right. different fields too. So this is, this is it's, it's intensive. So it's, what is it? A, it's a semester crunched into a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. about this. That, that's correct. Uh, when we, and this, this really connects to the online course, when, when we saw how massive, really, 
and uh, the, the, the word massive is in the acronym MOOC, Massive Open Online Courses. When we saw the massive in the MOOC, we realized there is something special here. And at the time, I started thinking that um, universities are no longer the same. And they do not just have to be places of research and teaching that are relatively local or regional at, at best. In fact, universities are innovation communities because we had students from every country in the world. They wanted to learn, but also, and that's uh, equally important, they wanted to collaborate. And I said to myself, huh, what is possible here when you can combine knowledge that you guide people in the process of collaboration and then you can create links bet between people that are unprecedented? Because you know, previously, how would uh, an entrepreneur in Chile work with an entrepreneur in Vietnam? And I realized that you can build ventures and organizations that are radically novel. That excited me. And so uh, when um, the, the president of MIT, Rafael Reif, and uh, the, the head of MIT Open Learning, Sanjay Sharman, who is my mentor, when they just th saw the, the level of community engagement in our course, they said, hey, there must be something more there too. And so we decided to organize uh, what we ended up calling boot camp. It wasn't called a boot camp in the very beginning. We, we didn't know what to call it. We just said, hey, there are some really outstanding people in this group of um, students online. Many of them uh, you know, have not come to MIT, have not studied at MIT, even, but we want them to, to be in our community. What can we do? And we organized a one-week boot camp, one week because we wanted to make it relatively short so that very busy people can still take the time. Mm -hmm. We wanted very busy people, so we made it short. And uh, that was a, a remarkable program. It was uh, a, a, a personal discovery for me, I think. It wasn't just about knowledge. It was about uh, self-discovery. These individuals came together and they discovered their new themselves. We call it the new you. They, they, they saw it. And when you see it, uh, something special happens in your life. Yeah. One week of time on a deep dive into a subject and you can gain potentially a semester of experience and have your new perspective awakened, have a new lens on the world with that subject matter. And then that can compound over time and make you such a better entrepreneur or, or scientist or whatever field as well. There's so many different fields that, that, you, guys, that you guys have. It's, uh, I th what, what are the what are the up I wrote down the upcoming ones there uh... well um, our latest one was uh, on AI and robotics and we explored uh, the future of work through AI and robotics and uh, we held that boot camp uh, in Tokyo Japan uh, because we want to reach a global audience we've made a decision to hold boot camps not just here at MIT on campus but to go to different parts of the world and we've offered boot camps in, in Japan, in Australia, in, in Brazil, in Turkey, in Taiwan, in Korea, in Mexico. And uh, we're going to be doing many more in different parts of the world. So we have, we have three coming up, um, two in June here in Cambridge. One will be in partnership with the Harvard Medical School and it will be a boot camp focused on innovation in healthcare. Uh, we will also have a boot camp in June called the Deep Tech and it will be a fast, deep introduction to AI, cybersecurity, machine learning, blockchain. Um, one very intensive week. And so I think if you want to explore the frontiers of these technologies, it's a good place to be. And then we have a bootcamp coming up in September in Germany that is focused on innovation in sports. Yeah, yeah. So around the world boot camps and all these different subjects. Yeah, sports, medicine, AI, cybersecurity, blockchain, this is, these are all such pressing fields and it's great that uh, people around the world are able to do it and it's cool that MIT has created a, uh, this, this, uh, uh, such a process that enables it to happen. And then um, now I wanted you to explain also the MicroMasters that you're also um, uh, co-founding and directing. Um, th this enables people to get a uh, 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 the uh, part of their master's degree online. Teach us, teach us about. Yeah. This. So the um, the the micro masters idea was conceived by Sanjay Sharma, uh, whom we discussed uh, already, uh, and I 
I think it's one of the most fundamental innovations in education. The underlying concept, let me first un uh, describe the underlying concept because I think it is going to be uh, interesting uh, to, to your community because this, this is something they may want to undertake. Uh, the underlying concept is inverted admissions. And let me explain it in, in, in the following sense. Yeah, every year, thousands of people apply for graduate school at MIT. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in many of our departments, uh, graduate uh, school applications are reviewed by faculty members, right? At, uh, at MIT Sloan, they're reviewed by um, an, ad an, ad an admissions committee that um, doesn't necessarily involve faculty, but in many departments, uh, graduate students are admitted by faculty. Now, what matters in an application? It, uh, you, you, you need to have a good recommendation, right? That uh, you have promised to do excellent research, right? That, that's what um, graduate school is for or you have promised to do excellent professional work of the highest caliber that integrates new knowledge into professions and creates new professions. You have to have uh, excellent grades, but by virtue of the fact that people apply from all over the world, the majority of people who apply, apply from schools and have recommendations from people that the MIT faculty members do not know, right? Why is that a problem? Context is important. And it is often challenging for MIT faculty members to know, is this a good school? How do I know that grades in this school are mm -hmm. worth the master? How do I know that the recommendation submitted is a recommendation that was treated with the greatest rigor that we expect at MIT? Very hard to know that, right? Inverted admissions takes that problem out of the question. It gives you an opportunity to show what you can do. You can yeah. take a number of MIT courses online. If you do well and you take a proctored exam, and again, you do it online, but we verify that it's you. If you take it, if you take it and you do it well, you have a chance to apply for a master's program at MIT. Yeah. And if you get in, your online credential, we call it the micro masters, and it's a substantial credential. It is equivalent to a semester of coursework at MIT, mm -hmm. right? So it's it is serious um, amount of work. Uh, that um, credit gets counted. And so you can graduate twice as fast and twice as inexpensively. Big difference. And now we have the first cohorts of students who came from the MicroMasters to the master's program at MIT. And all of the faculty members who work with them say they are outstanding. Yeah, you have an, another, so it's another f filtration mechanism of there's so many applicants from around the world. How do you make it so that you, they can prove that they're uh, capable of handling the rigor of the MIT graduate coursework? And you built a system that enables you to funnel um, the most optimal, uh, uh, yeah. You identified it correctly, exactly. Uh, the, the goal in admissions is to understand, can the person handle the rigor? of work here, right? Because we don't want to fail students. That's not a, that's, that's not a great thing to do. That, that's not a success for, for anyone, right? So you want to bring people here who will do well and take the, the best advantage of, of being here. But how do you know? Now, when the individual has gone through a sequence of rigorous coursework online, showed real persistence, in fact, persistence that is far greater than the persistence you need on campus because uh, normally you're taking the online courses while you're studying at another school or um, working uh, for a company, right? It takes some motivation and persistence to be able to do it. Uh, then we know that you will do well here and uh, the MicroMaster students do. And that hit inverted admissions as well, which is a very interesting concept. And then the incubation group as well. Can you explain that? Uh, very happy to do it. Um, again, the uh, incubation group was a conception of uh, Sanjay Sharma and he actually hired me into the incubation group. And the idea is simple. Uh, can we create a group that will generate new initiatives? The, the MOOC was the result of the incubation group. The bootcamp was the result of the incubation group. And uh, as, as soon as a new initiative uh, attains its legs, we stand it up as its own independent entity within the umbrella of the organization here. And so it's, it's a process of uh, creating new initiatives, creating sustainable foundations for them, and um, stimulating continuous innovation.
And then this is now going from just a university to a global innovation community. I love your, your tagline of decreasing, um, making it so there's no barriers between motivation and opportunity worldwide. Um, let's unpack uh, a little bit about these new pathways, apprenticeships versus internships. Teach us about this. Very happy to do that. Uh, so, you know, here here at MIT Open Learning, we want to imagine a new world of education and uh, professional accomplishment. Um, one of the one of the uh, challenges for us here is historically the world of education and the world of industry have been somewhat delinked, right? Uh, education was about the pursuit of truth, and that is very important, asking questions, and industry about uh, creating value. Now we see increasingly the need to integrate the two worlds. Why? And that's because people's professional lives become longer, right? Therefore, you have to continue updating your knowledge. Uh, and we also see that uh, people have to engage in many more fields of activity. And so exposure to education uh, is, is essential throughout a person's life. And uh, actually, even though I do have two master's degrees, I do think it's quite possible that I will go back to school at some point in the future. I, I do think this is possible. Probably it won't happen in a traditional sense, but um, this is going to be essential for me. Especially with the augmented reality, spatial computing era, right. so much easier to... And learn. I think this is, this is actually the, the year where um, augmented reality is, is actually showing real signs of uh, making impact on the world of education. We've, uh, we've had some very interesting breakthroughs at MIT that I'm excited about. But, you know, now we need to take the two worlds that have been uh, somewhat distinct and we need to integrate them so that people are more successful. And if they're more successful, they're happier, and that, that's, just, that's just a good thing. So that is why we're creating new pathways. We're integrating online coursework. We're integrating online credentials. We're integrating online boot camps. And now we're also focused on apprenticeships. What we want, mm -hmm. we have this. Uh, this is so crucial because of Bloom 2 Sigma, especially you'll perform two standard deviations uh, past the mean if you have a one-on-one -on -one mentorship. Really? Yeah, it's so crazy. Um, so psychologists have been studying it, uh -huh. and it's just a f fascinating phenomenon. So uh, another, I mean, almost everyone that we sit with on the show has had mentors that have just vastly helped them um, on an upward trajectory. So this is great, these apprenticeships, yeah. Oh, it's, uh, it, it's not surprising. I, w I would love a link because this is of interest to me. So I think uh, after yeah. after the show, you could, <laughs> totally. you could send it to me when you get a chance. But uh, yes, we want someone to go through a rigorous set of online courses with us, get a credential, go through a boot camp, get a credential, and then we want to create an apprenticeship opportunity and have the person go spend three to six months at the United Nations, yeah. at, uh, you know, perhaps FIFA, mm. at a startup, mm. at... Um, at Pfizer, at, uh, at a university, uh, being an apprentice to, 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 to a person who is on the cutting edge. Yeah. And, and that, in its own right, then becomes a credential to and your pathway to a new opportunity in, in, yes. in, in your vocation. You can stamp that I came and worked under you for three to six months at Open Learning, and that's on potentially on a decentralized ledger as well, and then everyone can see that. I've gained that Correct. experience. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. That's right. And uh, I think um, to, to, to your point that uh, you made um, b before we began, uh, that's what makes apprenticeships different from internships. Uh, you know, an apprenticeship uh, is very focused and it comes with a credential. And that credential is a hybrid educational and professional credential. Yeah, this, this, this uh, f f funneling of, of taking online, um, uh, democratizing online learning and then taking people that really want to um, gain further credentials through the system all the way up into the physical one-on-one -on -one apprenticeship world is very beautiful. And I think we've, up to this 8 billion population we're going to, is we, we've kind of lost a little bit of that one-on-one -on -one uh, apprenticeship uh, and also being able to log that as something that is uh, that is a major credential and I, I really look forward to that rising 
back up into our world and and yeah that's so critical um getting an experience in the real world yeah, yeah. i'm very hopeful of that I, I i'm very hopeful of that i think as soon as we begin uh, thinking beyond the constraints of the current uh, environment and uh, how universities are constructed today uh, we we stand a good shot at creating a new system that is far better yeah yeah and open learning is totally at the edge um, let's do uh, the two quick questions on the way out. First question is, are we in a simulation? Well, that's a deep question. That, that, that's really a, a deep question. That's, a, that, that's actually a deep question with very, very big um, consequences for philosophy, for sure, and, and possibly for, for action. Um, no, I don't believe so. I, I don't believe so. And, um, you know, and, and my answer to you stems from, from um, my children. When, when, I see, when, I, when I see my children, I have, I have three kids. I have a daughter Maria who is seven, daughter Lily who is uh, four, and son Daniel who is two. When I see them, and uh, I see their, their eternal beauty, you know, and the beauty, the eternal beauty of that moment when, when uh, your child uh, smiles with the most sincere, vibrant, megawatt smile. Mm. I just, uh, you know, I just don't think that there is a chance that that could have been simulated. Yeah. And then to think about your children also and the way that they'll be using the exponential technologies today that you know we didn't have growing up to learn the way that their mind is going to understand reality as well is going to be profoundly augmented compared to yeah how we grew up yeah 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 that, that that's possible yeah i i have a, a very very strong uh, feeling and faith in in, in them ch taking on the the world's biggest challenges you got three of them. Yeah, molding minds into the world in exponential technology age is interesting too. And the last question is, what is the most beautiful thing in the world? Oh, the smile of a child. Tell us why. Oh. Oh, there's, there's no feeling like it when you see it. There's just, um, I, I've, I've not had a better, more beautiful, you know, more light feeling um, ever. Um, yeah, it's just, it almost defies explanation. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a smile of a child, a smile of a child. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on to the show, Ardeen. Thank oh, you're, you. You're most welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate you doing this. And um, I think it's wonderful that you are reaching so many people with new ideas. Uh, you're, you're making real impact. And, Thank you. Know. We're very grateful for that. And we're very grateful for your work and the work of the MIT's Open Learning. Everyone, please check out MIT's Open Learning community. Check out all of the links in the bio below to do that. And go and share the content with other people around the world about how we can get the the eradicate the barriers between motivation and opportunity. What a profound statement. And also support the artists and entrepreneurs and organizations around the world that you believe in. Support simulation, our links are below. Also go and build the future, manifest your dreams into the world everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you soon. Peace. That's it, Erdine, great you job. You are great, great job. you are great. I'm okay, I have a long way to go brother, I have a long way to go.